another edition of Grace Under Pressure, where my guest today is Arun Gupta. I will tell you all about Mr. Gupta in just a moment. Grace Under Pressure is that show that focuses on what's too often dismissed as the soft stuff, the caring, the commitment we exert toward others. And when you do it from a leadership position, as you will definitely discover that Mr. Gupta is, you do it with a common cause to bring people together. Welcome, Arun Gupta. Thank you, John. It's great to be great. with you today. I want to tell folks about you. You, Arun Grupta, is the CEO of Noble Reach, which is a venture capital firm. And you are a lecturer at Stanford. And you are here to talk about your book called The Valley Meets the Venture. Excuse me. Venture Meets the Mission. Uh, you're also um, an advisor, senior advisor to my alma mater, Georgetown University. So, Hoya Saxa. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. So you're active with students, of course, but also in uh, venture capital and bridging um, the divide between private entrepreneurship and government ventures. So that's what we're going to talk about today. So welcome, Arun. So. Thank you again, John, for having me today. Great. Venture Meets Mission, as it describes, is how we can harness innovation in the private sector to help government uh, str uh, achieve come to solutions, some solutions to intractable problems. And boy, do we have intractable problems. So what led you to do this book with your co-authors, Arun? So. Yeah, John, so, you know, just a, a you know, quick context of, uh, you know, what shaped me getting to writing the book. You know, my father's been in public service for 45 years. He's been in Naval Sea System Command as an engineer, He's still working there today. Um, so public service has been in our family. Um, I spent my career in the entrepreneurial ecosystem. I was a venture capitalist at Carlisle and Columbia Capital for nearly 20 years and um, saw the power of entrepreneurship um, in solving problems. Um, in the latter half of that time, was spending time around uh, things at the intersection of mission tech and entrepreneurship. Um, and uh, you saw the magic when entrepreneurs could collaborate with government, and um, but also the challenges. Uh, I then, in, as I started thinking about my next chapter, started teaching a, a Georgetown, your alma mater, and at Stanford, and I was teaching a class called Valley Meets Mission, um, really about how do, you, how do you talk to these students about creating purposeful companies, not Candy Crush 3.0, and uh, doing that in a for-profit way to solve meaningful problems. And, um, you know, the energy that you saw um, from these students as they were kind of exposed to this world of being able to both do good and um, do well, um, you know, became uh, really the, the the inspiration for then saying um, of wanting to scale that message uh, through the book. Um, and so Venture Meets Mission was really inspired by the class. Um, and at the core of it, it's, um, you know, how do we harness, you know, what I think are two superpowers in this country, our ability to create talent through our higher ed ecosystem and our ability to innovate through our entrepreneurial ecosystem. Both are deeply optimistic ecosystems as well. Um, but then how do we, you know, build the infrastructure to connect those around big societal problems um, in a meaningful way and, 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 lever in, and in doing so, um, uh, harnessing the scale and reach of government, because um, you're not going to solve climate or cybersecurity or national defense um, or healthcare just by a startup by yourself, but you need the scale and reach of government to, to, to help in that. And so how do we create a renewed partnership um, to do that? No, that's exciting. And I'm so glad you um, mentioned your students because too often um, I'm the parent of millennials, uh, well into this constant workforce, but I'm guessing with the students you're dealing with maybe are more Gen Z, but they always get knocked for, you know, being self-centered or something. But uh, so often that's not true. And they gave you an impetus toward purpose-driven missions. Am I correct with that, Arun? So. Yeah. And, you know, John, I, I'm glad you mentioned that because I, I do think um, – the, uh, the onus, I think, actually falls on our generation um, of helping them get connected to these opportunities. Um, I think my observation, our observation, is that this generation, um, especially those that are in school, being shaped, um, you know, from, you know, recent existential threats of COVID, you know, you look at geopolitical threats of Ukraine, you look at what's happening um, on the environmental and climate front, and now great power competition with autocratic adversaries. Um, I would contend and argue that this generation arguably is more mission driven um, than previous generations um, because of those um, 
existential factors shaping them. Um, the issue has been that, you know, we don't have the infrastructure to connect them to these mission-driven opportunities. Um, they're not showing up on campus. It's not evident to them where to go. Um, and that, I think, is the opportunity that we're trying to, that we talk about both in the book, but now with Noble Reach and, uh, you know, in the half a billion dollar endowment we have, trying to see how we can help with building that infrastructure. That's great. I, I, I love that. And so now I got to ask you this, because when we talk about private and uh, public um, partnerships, and I've done a few shows on that. And there's always seems to be from at least from the outside world, at least my audience is mostly works in the corporate sector. So sometimes when you say government, I mean, people just freeze and go, oh, no, you know. So how do we get past that skepticism? Arun? So, yeah, no, it's, uh, it's you know, in, in, in fact, it that sentiment is a very pervasive sentiment and one that we felt like we had to address early on. In my class, the way we addressed it um, was by bringing in folks and having students interact with them, right? And uh, leaders from government, um, you know, former CA director like Mike Morell, uh, Jason Mattini, um, Senator, you know, Warner, and, you know, others that are real leaders and talking about this space around the need for this generation to play in. And what I saw that in that many, many times, once that that government was humanized, meaning that they were in front of real people talking about this. A lot of the biases that one has is really, um, you know, starts to melt away. Um, and that a lot of what we need to be doing is trying to humanize government in a meaningful way. Because when someone says, we don't want government, you say, well, what, what part of it don't you want? Um, who don't you want? You know, even something as simple as the difference between politics and civil servants. It, 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 it is lost on this generation. And so I think there's a deep process of humanization um, of that. And, you know, we write about that in the second chapter, which is like, how do we, you know, start to really break down government to its more molecular level, which is, you know, sub organizations, which are made up of just individuals and what the intent is of those individuals, which is, you know, positive intent. Uh, that doesn't mean like any other organization that don't make mistakes or they couldn't be doing things better. Um, but, uh, it, again, it, it's just a group of people and, and, and thinking through how we, uh, interact with them is what we're trying to highlight. That's great. Now, one of the things is that while you are solidly in the private sector, um, you do make the point that it is imperative for government to attract top people and not only attract them, but retain them. Um, so do any of your students go into the government sector or do you have suggestions for government? to facilitate the best and the brightest making a commitment at least for a period of time so. yeah i mean i think um you know that's what we, what we have found is that as students became available um or aware um, more you know uh, uh of, of the opportunities um they became more interested now having said that i think it's also this is a generation that's not thinking in 30-year careers so i think words matter um you know when, when you know when I talk, I say government sells careers, students are buying experiences. You know, government sells jobs and students are buying mission. So I think it's important to talk about what you're doing, uh, less about what you're doing and, and how, for how long you're going to do it, but why you're doing it, right? And, and, and break it down into two or three year groups so that it feels more like a Teach for America kind of program where one's going in can serve. You're not signing up to say, hey, I'm making a career decision at this point. Um, but you're allowing folks to kind of come in and get exposed to government, many of which may decide to stay. And also those that don't, you know, they should be viewed much like we do in the private sector when you leave. They're ambassadors for you. Right. And that's how you rebuild trust. Um, and, you know, looking at ways to create that programmatically so that you think of um, those first one or two year stints as career enhancers um, that only help you um, if you've gotten selected. I think we're all familiar with the, uh, in the legal profession, folks go become private, uh, excuse me, uh, clerk for a judge or go into the, to the, uh, Very much so. That's uh, exactly excuse right. me, work for justice department or prosecuting attorneys, that kind of stuff. And then of course, oh, go into private practice from that. But so I think, but the, the lens that you're casting is much wider than that. It's government wide. Um, and it's and specifically more, you know, John, on, to your point, you know, when you really think of tech and business talent, which, which is not coming into government, um, you know, it's largely, we don't have a program that would be similar to what you're describing for, for law students. Um, we also don't have um, 
you know, academics that are advising in engineering or business that have probably spent time in government, um, where, you know, that may, that is not the truth um, uh, uh, in some of these other areas. And so therefore, students aren't being advised on the benefits that they could get out of going in for a year or two um, and what that could lead to in the context of a more, um, you know, fulfilling career. Right. You, you draw an interesting distinction, and I'd like you to elaborate on it. You said students are uh, government or employers are looking for are offering jobs. Students are looking for a mission. Can you elaborate on that, Arun? So, yeah. Um, you know, look, I was having this conversation, you know, with with someone inside one of the agencies and they say, you know, look, when we market, we, you know, we, we say we want a data analyst. Um, and, you know, for a student. What, what, what captures their imagination isn't the n title of the job, it's the what they'll be doing in the job, right? So if you talk about the why, which is that same position that's a uh, data analyst is actually, you know, um, uh, evaluating geospatial information to help rebuild food networks in Ukraine, that's a really exciting opportunity, right? And so that's the mission, that's the why. Um, and I think we put too much uh, emphasis you know, on the what. Um, and I think students are inspired by the why. And um, words matter. And, uh, you know, what we've seen is that when you can start talking about it in that context, um, you know, both with our intern program and our scholars program, you know, the level of interest has far exceeded what we could, you know, support from a demand perspective. You raise an interesting point when you mention the food networks in Ukraine, which obviously is vitally important to Ukrainians. But within the scope of the United States government, it's pretty small and insignificant. I don't I mean, I'm not being pejorative, but I think you're hitting on a key point is there are lots of, quote, little things going on that have significant impact. That's Can exactly you expand on that? Arun? So. No, that's exactly right, is, is that there's so many meaningful projects um, that are going on um, when where can a, where someone can apply their tech um, and business talents against. I'll give you an example. If you're in commerce with the CHIPS Act right now and helping rebuild our semiconductor infrastructure for national security and economic security, um, there's phenomenal work to be done there. Um, if you look at you know what, what's going on at Department of Energy with the LPO program and, and the the funding of trying to you know really you know build our climate tech ecosystem, um, both from a technology and again business perspective and entrepreneurial perspective, phenomenal work going there. Uh, obviously, there's important work in the IC, the intelligence community, and the in in our national security infrastructure. Um, you know as we prepare. Um, for you know, great power competition and, and and how we compete with autonomous drones and 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 um, and so you know you can go area to area. It really just comes down to what's your passion, right? What area is of greatest interest to you? But there's a place and need for that right now. And the big through line, right? You know that's currently happening is obviously with AI um, and the impact AI has on you know every every one of these agencies. Great. Well, uh, now going, pulling the lens out a little bit. So we talk about climate change, which is imperative in our world right now. And so I can see many students, uh, uh, because I firmly believe our generation has not done uh, a real good job of being climate stewards. <laughs> so so the young people are faced with existential threats in many ways. I mean, the climate is an existential issue. So when you say, here's something you can do in government, are there a multiplicity of things or not rather than just one big thing? Am I correct in that, Arun? So that, 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 that's exactly right. And in, in, in that it, it's not only there's a multiple different places you can apply that same talent. And then, you know, the important is you're, you're developing skills in that process that are transferable both inside of government. But, you know, the idea is to, those same skills are, are usable if you decide to go outside either in a, early stage venture or uh, a more corporate environment or back into academia for um, for any work you want to do there. OK, now you're pitching this government. I'm getting excited about it. Where do I sign up? But yeah. here's the here's the cold, hard reality, which comes back to your world from the private sector. And you write about this is entrepreneurs need to face different challenges, really, from funding goals, the, the lifetime of the program, whatever. So what co what coaching, what perspective? can you offer um, Arun? So. Yes. Um, you know, look, 
when you're an entrepreneur and you're uh, collaborating with government, um, you know, there's a few things to keep in mind. You know, one, and, uh, you know, Amy Ziegart talks about this, with, with, is understanding the cultural differences. Um, and so having empathy for your customer and empathy for who they are. Um, I think many times, uh, you know, she talks about the hoodie versus suits culture. And uh, sometimes the hoodie culture, you know, from the Valley, you know, can, can be somewhat condescending, right? And saying, this is what you need to do. This is how you need to do it. This is what you don't understand. And um, look, like, it, again, if we, if we break all these institutions down to their molecular level of being a group of individuals, no individual wants to hear that. Right. Um, so understanding the language is important, understanding how to talk to them. And I think, you know, the best startups are the ones that have teams that have both, you know, private sector, but also um, government experience, because you need that shared vernacular of, of, of how to talk, that shared understanding of how the system works. Um, but more importantly, the undercurrent of all that is trust. Um, you know, it, it's hard to just kind of come in not having any relationships, any understanding and saying, hey, buy my product um, because <laughs> we're better. Um, you know, even in the private sector, that's not how that works. Right. Um, people are, make decisions based on trust. Um, and so, you know, the number one thing I would say for any startup looking to collaborate with government, but it's no different than anywhere else, is build a team that can really engender that trust and build an advisory board and build. Um, and, and have that understanding early on. Okay. Now, let's flip this because you are in contact with government officials and even some in politics as well. So what coaching, what insights do you offer them about dealing with entrepreneurs? You know, yeah, you know? no, it's interesting. I was just on the call yesterday, um, you know, with some congressional folks talking about this, about how they collaborate more with, you know, the venture community and, and, and entrepreneurs. And, you know, there was a conversation around tax incentives and, and things of that sort. And, um, you know, really quickly, the conversation really is more about it's it, what, what entrepreneurs and, in, in, you know, the surrounding ecosystem of, you know, funding and innovation funding um, are looking for more than capital is contracts, right? So when you think about it and why is that the case, you know, if I'm a startup, you know, getting a $2 million um, you know, Cibber grant is nice, but it doesn't help me go raise more money from VCs. Why? Because it, it's not a demand signal. What, 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 what venture folks are investing in is seeing that there's demand for the product that you're building. Um, and then we want to help scale that because we think there's, you know, a sizable market with that. Um, the way you show demand is through contracts, right? And so thinking about how we get more contracts out there um, in, in, in a timely and efficient manner um, is, is important. And I think you're seeing agencies like Space Force that are really taking a leading edge, you know, um, view on how to do that. Uh, I think the second is focusing on outcomes, right? Um, you know, the government has the capacity to do this. We, when you, if you look at the, the us rebuilding our space superiority today, that whole industry was a result of how NASA collaborated with the private sector yes. um, based on outcomes and putting money behind that to hit certain goals. If you look at what we did with Operation Warp Speed and Moderna getting a vaccine out, it was about putting an outcome out there that the private sector can then mobilize capital, talent, and tech to see if they can you know, meet those milestones. Well, I think the more the government can think about outcomes, not inputs, um, I, I, I think it aligns the incentives in a, in a meaningful way. You know, I, I'm glad you mentioned that the space program of the 60s or you alluded to it. And uh, again, of course, with COVID, the vaccine and things like that, these kinds of partnerships have been going on at least all through the 20th century that I know of. So this is, quote, not new, the government, public, uh, government and private partnership. It just has a different cast now. And I think you're bringing the entrepreneurial spirit to it. Am I correct with that? So That's correct. That's exactly yeah. right. Great. So um, when is there, a, or perhaps your firm is, a, maybe central sources of funding of our government or whatever that can attract tech to say, hey, bring us your technology and we'll find it, we'll fund you for it. It's, it, it's maybe less outcome derivative, but it might be an intersection that people don't know about yet until they're exposed. Is, is that kind of thing going on, Arun? So. That, that is happening today. I mean, what we're helping with is um, research that's happening inside of government, like at DARPA and NSF, 
And how do we connect that research and science to entrepreneurs um, to help commercialize it? Um, we'll purpose that tech in a meaningful way. And, um, you know, we're finding great success there because at the end of the day, you know, ventures are about people. They're not about technology. Great. Now, you've talked about outcomes and success and stuff. Is there one or two stories you like to share with either government officials or students about successes that you've seen and that open the door to new possibilities? So, yeah, I mean, look, to to the the ones that are um, most notable for folks, if, is if you look at SpaceX and if you look at Moderna today, you know, SpaceX is arguably the most valuable private company in the world. Um, but the, you know, the, the part of that story that I think many times gets overlooked was the role of government in playing in that and creating that, right? So much of that funding was government funding. Um, so much of that was the way the government interacted with the private sector um, to put outcomes out there um, and then have them kind of, mobilize and compete to get to, to achieve those outcomes for further funding. Um, I think the second, you know, if you look at Moderna, it was the same thing. And, um, and, and so in the book, even what we try to do is highlight these kinds of stories and ask the question of like, we have the capacity as a country to do this. We've done it. The question is, how do we make it the norm and not the outlier? We tend to do it in times of crisis. Um, and how do we make this the norm? Right. And um, I think that's a, a large part of what we we also tried to show. I mean, another example, um, sometimes it's not about even the what you're doing, but the how you're doing it. Um, there was a company called 1901 that was um, doing work, uh, providing managed security services and cloud services to the government agencies. But, you know, the way they were doing it was by, um, you know, upskilling talent in southwest Virginia and having them be the ones. And so rather than trying to compete with the same share of tech talent around the beltway, where you're selling bodies into these, you're changing the model and saying, you tell us what outcome you're looking for. And then let us take care of how we deliver that outcome to you. You know, that is a wonderful story. Uh, as opposed because, to the yeah. government saying like, hey, we need 10 bodies or 15 bodies to manage this. They were right. saying, you tell us what devices you need managed. We'll manage it for you at a certain cost that, you know, um, is probably cheaper. And you let us take care of it. And, and the way they you know, were able to do that effectively was upskilling and training talent in Southwest Virginia. Um, and you're, you know, it, it has a, a, a dual impact because you're creating jobs. Um, and rather than having a digital divide, you have a digital bridge where you're creating jobs because of technology in an area that otherwise may not have had those same kind of opportunities. Right. My sense is that much of our discussion, at least in my mind, has been federal funding. Um, is, there, is there an outreach or a partnership with state or local governments that you see, Arun? So. Um, there's work happening with state and local governments. We've had less of it to date just because we're getting started and um, but hope to do so. Um, you know, there's some innovative programs that are being done where some of the big tech players are collaborating with universities, specifically in Louisiana, um, whereby uh, what they're doing is providing their platform and then training for students um, to become, you know, cyber experts. And, you know, in, in, that the, in doing so, the students get work experience while they're in school um, so that when they graduate, they're eligible to be hired by the state, right? And so, because in many of these uh, situations, you know, to hire someone, you have to have at least, you know, two to four years worth of work experience um, and, you know, the innovation there is to collaborate with the state's universities to get these students experience while they're in school so that that becomes an available pool to hire from as they graduate. It's a great story. Well, we are racing along here and um, I, we can be going on and on and on. But as we're coming to the end of the program, um, I ask every guest a story about grace. Do you have one you'd like to share with us, Arun? So. Yeah, I mean, uh, you and I were just chatting about this earlier, and um, look, Grace has been a uh, a big part of of my life. Um, and you know, when you think about being shaped around social good and and what we're trying to do, you know, uh, you know, there's a program that I was involved with at Georgetown um, called the Pivot Program, um, where we were teaching entrepreneurship to uh, uh, recently released you know, violent crime felons. 
um, to re reduce the recidivism cycle. And um, you know what I found when I was teaching that class and having taught MBAs and undergrads um, in, in teaching you know this group was the depth of thinking, right? And it really challenged a lot of my own biases. It challenged my own biases of, of why and how. Um, and sometimes, you know, the outcome that they're getting measured by is a, a result of all these smaller outcomes that in other neighborhoods or other communities, um, you know, get fixed along the way because of community or guidance and, and uh, you know, the folks running that program, uh, uh, Alyssa Lovegrove and others, um, you know, really brought me into, you know, a community here where I felt a sense of real purpose and, and depth uh, of folks that really did want to kind of, you know, go back and create businesses and, and do things and be productive parts of society um, in a more, you know, meaningful and touching way. Um, and I, it deeply impacted me. It, it deeply impacted kind of how I viewed, you know, uh, if folks that have had these kinds of challenges and have been able to overcome them now want to dedicate their life back to social good, um, you know, it, 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 you can't help but reflect how, how you want to spend your time as well. What a powerful story. And that certainly is a powerful story of grace, both for yourself and giving back and what you've been from it and the gift that you have given to the students who many of whom have had the best advantage uh, of advantages and are turning a life around their lives have turned their lives around and are in turn giving back. So what a great story of grace. Arun, it's been a uh, pleasure to meet you. How can people find you? Um, so. Uh, yes. So um, as far as Noble Reach, um, you could go to NobleReachFDN.org um, to learn more about the organization. Um, as far as the, the book, Venture Meets Mission, it's available on Amazon. Um, you could also go to VentureMeetsMission.com um, and find more information on that. Um, we're collaborating with about uh, 20 universities right now um, and uh, you know, a number of corporate mission venture partners as well. And so, uh, you know, really are out there just wanting to hopefully inspire um, and this next generation um, into what I think is really truly a, a generational opportunity for them to be able to align people, purpose and profit in a way um, that can shape their careers in a hopefully a very positive way. Well, that is a uplifting story. And um, I will say, for one, you are living a life of grace, Arun. So thank you for giving back and opening doors for others and helping our government uh, serve its constituents better, which makes for a better world. So with that, uh, we will go out. So thank you, John.